All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This webinar is being brought to you by the ACR Commission on Radiation Oncology Education Committee. Uh, before we begin the session, please join us in a moment of silence just to acknowledge the difficult times that everyone continues to face with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, social injustice, and in general, of course, for our cancer patients and their families. Thank you. Today, we'll be discussing applications of artificial intelligence, uh, which is a topic that should be at the forefront of everyone's minds in medicine and especially in radiation oncology. I know that I've personally seen significant improvements over the past few years in areas such as auto contouring and workflow upgrades. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing how the field continues to embrace AI moving forward. Um, also, I cannot take credit for the fun Rise of the Machines Terminator reference here. That's all from my excellent co-moderator, Arya Amini from City of Hope. Either way, I will also be moderating this discussion. My name is Aaron Bush. I'm a radiation oncology resident at Mayo Clinic and serve as the national resident representative to the ACR. Before we move forward, please remember to mute your microphones and use the Zoom communications tools such as the Q&A and chat features to submit or ask your questions. Um, we'll plan to have time for audience Q&A at the end of our scheduled presentations. For those of you who are unaware, this webinar is a part of an ongoing series of educational webinars brought to you by the ACR. Uh, recent topics have included particle therapy, residency match concerns, and the ROAPM. So please visit our page at ACR Radiation Oncology Resources. Also, please consider joining the ACR to further support these education initiatives and have the most up-to-date information on RADOMP related ACR material. A, a brief description here of our webinars is for you to refer to. And the objectives for this webinar are listed here, uh, which include catching you all up on the state of artificial intelligence and radiation ecology now, exploring ongoing research in this space, and considering the future relationship between AI and radiation oncology. So without further ado, I'd like to now introduce the real stars of this webinar. First, we have um, Dr. John Kang. He's an assistant professor and biomedical informatics lead at the Department of Radiation Oncology at University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Kang completed his MD and PhD at the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, respectively, uh, and his um, residency at the University of Rochester. His clinical interests are in both thoracic malignancies and rear radiation. And his research interests are, of course, in clinical artificial intelligence, um, but specifically in clinical model evaluation, unsupervised and minimally, unsu uh, minimally supervised methods, word patient representations, and natural language processing, um, which I hope he expands on more here today. Our second speaker um, will be Dr. Beth Beadle, who is a professor of radiation oncology and the director of head and neck radiation at Stanford University. Uh, she received her bachelor's MD and PhD all at Northwestern University, um, completed her internship there as well um, before moving down to Houston um, for her residency in radiation oncology at MD Anderson. Um, she joined the faculty there and has since transitioned over to Stanford in 2017. Um, and her main interests have been improving patient care through technology. Um, she has numerous projects, um, though some highlights are a home monitoring device to reduce hospitalization and ER visits for patients, um, head and neck cancer, radiation patients specifically, who we know desperately need those types of care, uh, as well as AI and deep learning techniques to develop fully automated radiation treatment planning, uh, interestingly for patients in low and middle income countries throughout the world. Uh, and so thank you so much to both of you for being here. And I'll go ahead and, and pass the baton here to Dr. Kang to go and get started. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bush, for that uh, introduction. And thank you to ACR for inviting me. Um, before I uh, let me full screen this, um, I did want to say that I'm recovering from a cold and I have this lingering cough. But I did test okay. negative for COVID three times. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Looks good. Ease everybody on the Zoom call. All right. So, um, I'll be talking today about the state of AI and radiation oncology. Um, and I'll also be talking a little bit about my research as well. 
Um, my conflict of interest, uh, potential conflict of interest is that one of my family member works for Change Healthcare, which is a publicly traded uh, for-profit uh, health technology company. Um, so this is the outline. Um, I'll talk about AI implementation in radiation oncology uh, currently, um, including AI for safety, workflow, AI to improve outcomes, um, and uh, just briefly touch on AI in education and clinical research. Uh, I believe Dr. Beadle will uh, expand upon some of those themes. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about my own uh, research as well. So um, as Dr. Bush has mentioned, there's been a lot of discussion in AI and radiation oncology, um, quite a few review articles and key opinion pieces, um, uh, as well as in uh, imaging as well in the radiology space as we all know. Um, so this was uh, one such uh, article that came out about four years ago. Um, and they touched about uh, upon a few current themes at that time. So image segmentation, um, radiotherapy, dose optimization, clinical decision support and outcomes prediction, as well as that uh, QA. Here, Dr. Kang, I'm going to interrupt you real quickly here. It seems like you're, there's a little bit of a uh, uh, connection issue. I hear your audio going in and out. Okay. Uh, let me see. Yeah, if you can see if there might be a, a quick edit for that. If not, we, we could switch the order and, and give you give you time to move if needed. Um, is, is it any better? I can hear you fine now. Great. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry about that. No, no worries. You can go ahead. Thank you. So um, these four themes were outlined in 2018 in this review article. And um, so I wanted to touch upon kind of uh, what advancements we've made in the past uh, four years or so. Um, and uh, actually, there was a special issue of uh, clinical oncology, um, which is the uh, the official journal of the Royal College of Radiologists over in the UK, um, where um, my co-editors and I, we uh, compiled a group of um, uh, both review articles with some original research as well. And they were broken down to th uh, three main themes. So AI for safety and workflow, AI to improve outcomes, as well as uh, AI in education and clinical research. So um, AI and safety and workflow uh, does include, you know, auto segmentation and radiotherapy planning. Um, I've seen uh, a few, several institutions uh, with doing research on this, and there are. Hey, Dr. Kang, I uh, apologize. Oh, yeah, I still, I still think you're going in and out a little bit. Um, okay. So, so if you wouldn't mind, I think we'll, we'll just switch to the order here and we'll have Dr. Beadle go first um, and make sure her connection is, is okay as well. Um, and, then, and then maybe you could, could switch uh, computers if possible, because it might be an internet connection issue. Okay. Okay. I no, appreciate it. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm Beth Beadle. Um, I had hoped that we would build on Dr. Kang's presentation for mine, but we'll just make do uh, right now. So um, as Dr. Bush said, I work at Stanford and my interest is improving patient care through the use of artificial intelligence and I have a special interest in global health. So I think we will go backwards to talk about some of the underpinnings of AI and some of the ongoing research um, uh, initiatives um, and developments in uh, in the field with Dr. Kang. Um, but to start, um, I have no relevant disclosures. Um, I have funding from the NIH and NCI. I don't have um, funding from industry. I don't exist on uh, open payments, and that's not because it's a bad or good thing. But for those of you who are interested in research, um, it is not necessarily um, required uh, to partner with industry funding for that. So for my part of the talk, I wanted to focus on the integration of technology, how we bring things into clinical care or really just into the world but, um, uh, from a technology perspective. I'm gonna share with you my um, true passion, which is using this technology to improve um, 
the quality and availability of care throughout the world, where there's a huge shortage of available radiation oncology for patients in need. Talk about the practical implications of AI and radiation oncology, and then talk about the fears in the future. And then we'll go back to Dr. Pat. So, Separate from radiation oncology or clinical medicine, there is um, a well-known um, description of how technology is integrated into the world um, called the Gartner hype cycle, where with time we go um, on the x-axis and visibility on the y-axis, something is developed and over time it gets more visible and it reaches a peak where everyone thinks it is going to save the world or their profession. Um, and then people realize that it's uh, too good to be true and things have practical implications and it falls down to what they call the trough of, trough of disillusionment. Well, this is never going to work. We thought it would. But over time, a lot of times you can take those big dreams, get over your disappointments and really get back to a place where they're just practically useful in certain scenarios. So it's called the slope of enlightenment and then the plateau of productivity. So our goal is to make something from a technology perspective that's going to ultimately help our patients and help us and help our staff get the care that they need. And it's probably not going to save the world, but hopefully it will get to a point of productivity. Now, what this Gartner hype cycle doesn't include is um, probably there's a nadir of uselessness. There's probably something that, again, has very, very um, large promises. We realize this isn't going to work, and then we still realize this isn't going to work. And, you know, just as some examples for those of you that's been on friends or for your social media, or for those of you that had a car with the, the answer to the world safety technology, which was the auto seat belt several decades ago, neither of these things, I think, is coming back into useful. Um, places in our world, but, um, you know, we got over both of those. Um, if you look at what these are published in a lot of different organizations and a lot of different, um, different paradigms, look at this hype cycle to kind of see what is coming and where things are in development. So this was um, the hype cycle for emerging technologies in 2021 and for artificial intelligence also in 2021. And again, they go in and sort of identify where things are. So for emerging technologies at the top of inflated expectations was NFTs. So we'll see where that ends up. But again, machine readable legislation, AI driven innovation, all of those things we think are on the up and up. From artificial intelligence perspective, you can see again where things are. Autonomous vehicles, thought they were gonna save the world, realized that they're not, but they're coming back in terms of what technology we can use to actually be integrated into practical life and make the world a better place. So all of these things are the things that we need to keep in mind as we integrate new technology into, into oncology, into radiology, into medical practice. What is going to be useful and what can we practically implement over time? So where can AI fit in radiation oncology? What we do takes a lot of steps. And this is just even the pretty much basic workflow for radiation oncology, let alone for radiology, for pathology, for diagnostic testing upstream, and for a long-term surveillance downstream. So for all of our patients, we need to diagnose and evaluate them. We need to do treatment planning scanning, typically a CT. We need to decide what um, doses the tumor and the normal tissues are going to get, delineate those on that scan, and then have a handoff to a planner who's going to have to determine beam arrangements, run a computer to do so, calculate normal dose to targets and normal tissues, optimize the plan and delivery, and then go back with another handoff to the physician to determine whether or not what they decided was appropriate, identify any edits, re-optimize and approve the plan, which then prompts another handoff to a physicist who will perform quality assurance on that plan, make sure that any issues are rectified before delivery, approve the plan to get the patient treated. So in terms of opportunities for artificial intelligence, there's a lot of opportunity for better workflow, reduced handoffs, and more automation in this process, which inherently is repetitive. So from our perspective and then the work that I've done, again, limited to the radiation oncology practice, 
there are a whole lot of this most likely can be automated and use deep learning technologies in order to make this more streamlined and more consistent as well as more efficient. So we could automate contouring and planning tasks. If we've treated a thousand patients, is the thousand and first patient going to be that much different that we couldn't use all of the information that we created and know from past patients to create a template and machine learning algorithm to predict the contour and dose and treatment planning that we need? Can we go through and realize that if we do things the right at the first time and also know how good we can get things and what are our requirements for quality, can we get more consistent contours, more consistent plans and less need for the edit? And can we embed a quality insurance process in this, again, using AI and deep learning techniques in order to make certain that by the time the physicist gets the plan, there is a very low chance that there's going to be any deviations or issues that are there. There was a um, review um, in oncology last year written by a junior faculty member named Tucker Netherton at MD Anderson, where he went through and really looked at automatable tasks in radiation oncology. And these were a variety of different things, but all probably suitable for some degree of automation. Those included physical tasks, tasks knowledge-based tasks, social and, um, tasks as well, to see what we could do in order to try to make this a less um, complicated diagram and really streamline the role of the dosimetrist, the physicist, and the radiation oncologist in order to do that. Um, so moving forward, really, we have a big opportunity in order to, um, to streamline this and use um, technology to try to make the entirety of the radiation planning process better. Now, I came to my interest in, in AI and deep learning and automated um, treatment planning, mostly from my interest in global health. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about my example of the integration of this technology, which is uh, a program called the Radiation Planning Assistant, which I co-created with Lawrence Court, who's a physicist at MD Anderson. And we were really inspired by the lack of global radiotherapy resources. And so um, by the year 2030, there's an estimate by the WHO that there'll be between 26 to 30 million cancer cases worldwide. And by far and away, those are gonna be concentrated in low and middle income countries that do not in any way have the capacity to deal with them. And even as we move forward and are do better with diagnosis of patients, we then hit um, a bottleneck where they are diagnosed but cannot be treated due to lack of available cancer treatment resources. So this is a recent um, uh, article in Lancet Oncology by Elmore et al. that focuses on Africa as an example, showing that as of March 2020, only 52% of African countries had any access to external beam radiotherapy. Only 39% had access to brachytherapy, which is extremely concerning since the large majority of cancers on the African continent are cervical cancers that are best served by brachytherapy for treatment. And no individual country met the capacity um, up with radiation therapy of the, the they needed based on their population and estimated cancer um, incidence. And that acceptable practice is one machine per 250,000 population. So none of them met that. And of those, the North and South Africa countries, not um, all had greater than 50% of all radiation machines. So you can see here um, the mega voltage units per 1,000 cases in color, the number of mega voltage cases, and then again, where the population is. So the population isn't where, um, it, and the cancer incidence is not even where the few machines are. But even if you have machines, that doesn't solve the problem. Um, there's a lot of well-meaning philanthropic organizations and governments that um, decide to invest in radiotherapy resources because it is a truly cost-effective mechanism to care for patients in both definitive and palliative settings. But then they realize that they don't have the staff to run it. And this is now um, almost eight year old analysis that was done and published in the Red Journal, showing that with the increased estimate of cancer cases, we were gonna have a shortfall of 12,000 radiation oncologists 
almost 10,000 medical physicists and almost 30,000 radiation therapists. So even if we fix the issue with hardware, we are not gonna fix the issue with skilled staff to run it and to care for these patients. So the goal of our project, which is the Radiation Planning Assistant, is to improve access and quality of care worldwide by the use of, auto, um, of AAI and machine learning techniques. So what we envision is that um, anywhere in the world, you could upload a simulation scan and put in a plan order. So I could tell the system um, what was to be treated and what my goals were with regard to, um, to dose and fractionation. It would upload um, to the RPA. It would automatically generate contours that then could be transferred back for editing and review. Once those are approved, it would go back for a um, for a plan review or plan creation. And within 30 minutes, a fully automated radiation plan would be um, available for review, transferred back to the institutional TPS, and then ready to go. This is a look at the dashboard. And ultimately, the goal was that we would be able to have anyone access um, high quality radiation, automated resources with a plan and contours generated within 30 minutes. This was the original plan. We're actually realizing that um, these edits don't make as much difference as we would hope. And so we're trying to make this a single process there. And right now, um, the capacity would be for over 100,000 patients a year. So what we're trying to do is use this technology in order to make the flow chart a lot easier so that a physician would be needed to diagnose and evaluate the cancer, do a CT scan and decide what they want to do. And pretty much later, it comes back fully contoured and planned and ready for calculation in the local treatment planning system and delivery. This also, in addition to just um, dealing with the minimization of staff there, is it also would allow patients to be treated very quickly after they are seen because transportation and distance and being away from home or forum or village are such issues that once a patient is seen and diagnosed, oftentimes they are unable to come back for their treatment. So our hope is that this type of system is gonna improve the access to care, overcome workforce challenges, reduce the tasks for those involved, reduce dif um, differences between treatment approaches, um, and increase the safety by reducing the number of human error opportunities and handoffs. So what have we been able to do? We can auto reliably auto contour normal tissues and targets, including CTVs for the head and neck. We can auto plan anywhere from 3D conformal to VMAT plans um, shown here with a high degree of acceptability. And we can also internally quality assure. So each task that we do is done using two different algorithms and then compared. Anything that disagrees is flagged as a potential problem. So here you can see a flagged case um, for um, normal tissue contouring for the head and neck. And here you can see one for um, superior border for field box for cervical cancer. We took all of these, um, the head and neck plans to the head and neck meeting in 2020, right before the world ended because of COVID. And I bothered a bunch of people to look at plans that were blinded um, and see whether or not they preferred the automated plan or the um, manual plan. And in fact, the majority of, pay, of, of head and neck specialists preferred either the auto plan or said that there were only minor edits between the and ultimately, we've taken all of the things that we've built out so far to test to see if people would actually treat with them. So with 31 radiation oncologists from 10 different institutions, five countries, um, four continents, and almost 8,000 ratings, 90 to 100% of the RPA-generated contours and plans were acceptable as is, or only with minor edits, which, which the practitioners felt were either mostly stylistic or would take 10 minutes plus to make, and 100% of them were considered safe for delivery. But we learned a lot of things through this process. Um, a couple of things that we learned are that there's discrepancy between metrics and clinical acceptability. When we interrupted Dr. King for the audio issues, I think he was talking about different metrics to, to, um, to look at quality of these contours, things that can match really well, um, still are unacceptable to clinicians, and things that are clinically acceptable sometimes look terrible in terms of metrics. So that's one thing that makes it hard in order to say whether or not your system is successful. There are a lot of differences between personal and institutional approaches to contouring normal tissues targets. So, 
really the most important thing is to be able to um, modify a specific um, algorithm to fit the clinical practice. A lot of practitioners are committed to making edits and a lot of them don't know that they're technically clinically meaningless. Um, so we will go and see people put in clinical edits, um, edit the parotid by a millimeter, edit the CTV by two. And when we put on the edits, um, it has no clinical um, effect on the plan. Um, workflow needs to be efficient. No one wants a system that makes things better to make things worse. And no one has the time to help um, make this better if it doesn't get us most of the way there at the beginning. And then finally, there are a lot of regulatory issues with this, especially in terms of international collaboration um, because of the need to quality assure and make sure that all the regulatory and medical legal issues are, are, um, are taken care of. And I think this is true in the United States as well. And in the end, um, there's been, as, as Dr. Kang was talking, there's more and more information about machine learning um, and AI generated controversial plans. And I think a lot of the preclinical testing suggested um, that these were gonna be clinically acceptable. And when push comes to shove and your patients at the other side of that decision, sometimes it's different. This is a very elegant study done at, um, by the group at uh, PMH and published in 2021, that when they look at the percentage of treatment plans that were acceptable um, uh, before and after clinical deployment, they say, uh, saw a significant decrease. So when they were doing their initial testing, 89% of the machine learning plans were considered acceptable, and 72% were selected over the human manual plan. But when push came to shove and they rolled this out clinically, that reduced from 83% to so again, on behalf of patients, you want your doctors to pick the best for you, and that's different in a real-world scenario than necessarily a testing scenario. So we have to figure out how to, how to get over that. Um, Dr. King briefly highlighted the, um, the recent uh, um, edition of clinical oncology that he um, co-edited, and it's a really great resource for people interested. I just call you at your attention to the Altathea framework. This is borrowed from the um, Rolls-Royce um, uh, and automotive industry, where they look in terms of automation and technology in terms of social impact, accuracy, and trust, and governance. And I think all of these things um, have to be taken into account with, um, with all of the applications of AI and implementation in clinical medicine. And I think a lot of the issues that we run into kind of run, fall into two bins. Um, the first is job security. There's significant issue that, um, that by automating radiation treatment planning, by automating pathology slide evaluation or dermatology evaluation um, or planning, contouring that we will be eliminating or reducing the need for, for certain disciplines, including dosimetry or physics. Um, and there have been several um, concerns about this that have been published um, in a fairly recent review, 57% um, believe there would be economic implications of, of artificial intelligence on radiation oncology. So it's something that we have to think about and deal with um, in terms of what the implications are um, for our patients and also for our staff and our departments. I think the other major fear goes into the bin of safety and security. If you press a button and a plan comes out, how can you be certain that it is exactly what you wanted and what you don't know, you don't know. So there have been a few robust um, uh, FMEA analyses um, of potential failure modes um, for AI in radiation oncology. A lot of these end up being operator error. Um, so again, if you don't put in the information correctly, that can be a problem, but you can also see off-label use. So if I choose to use it for something it wasn't built for, data transfer error, automation bias, those things. And also, I think we always have to keep in mind kind of HIPAA and patient security and um, privacy issues. And this is a nice diagram that shows that the health information generated by HIPAA is actually just the tip of the iceberg in terms of things that could be used um, uh, um, for a problem. So, um, so I think it's a really exciting time and I look forward to going back to Dr. King's review of where we are. Um, I think in terms of AI opportunities, one of the biggest things that I see is in global health and underscore communities, because the truth of the matter is as well, some of us are worried about the implications of the United States and other 
um, uh, high income areas on work flow and work um, and work staff. Fundamentally, again, we are thousands of professionals down um, globally, and one way to get patients treated is to do um, to do it using these types of techniques. And in fact, it's probably the only way to do it. We do need for a lot of further research to establish paradigms, best practices, and practical implications so that we don't build something that in testing looks great and then in clinical implementation is not acceptable. And this is actually a recent um, award um, uh, uh, request for applications from the um, from the NIH looking for the validation of artificial intelligence tools. And then finally, I think it's, a, it's also especially interesting for complex and time-consuming treatment tasks. So for those people who have MRI linear accelerators or doing daily adaptive planning, those take a huge amount of work and using these techniques to be able to pivot rapidly to do controversy plans, I think is going to really be required in order to make those for courses in, um, in, the, in the mission. Now, one thing to say is that I think some of us, or I think the tendency is to think that we're cheating by auto contouring or auto planning or not making things as complicated as, as they are right now. Um, but the world used to be a much simpler place. So um, again, I treat head and neck cancer. So before my time, that used to be a plain film and a wax pencil, and then you go about your day. And now um, for anyone who does treat head and neck cancer or the residents who treat head and neck cancer, there goes your afternoon, uh, making sure that everything is contoured and planned. So using AI techniques doesn't necessarily, it's not cheating, it's actually using high quality data in order to make yourself more efficient, get the patient um, treated um, more quickly and more accurately. Um, so overall, I think that the future is really bright and I'm really excited about this field. I think AI is a truly revolutionary approach to improving radiation and, and oncology care for patients. Um, and also for providers, I think it's going to allow a lot of opportunity to do things um, that we haven't been able to do so far, that we haven't been able to do from a staffing perspective or pivot as quickly as necessary in order to do. But it has to be integrated with intent, with ethics, with engagement, and with ongoing monitoring. And it also must address a clinically relevant problem. I think a lot of people, especially if you're approached by technology companies or something like that to do something. They, they create a thing and you look at the thing and you say, that's great, but I don't really need the thing, but the thing doesn't help me. Um, so I think really um, having um, um, productive collaborations is really important. Um, and to that end, I thought that one of the most interesting things I read about AI is that there was this article a few years ago about um, using AI to name guinea pigs. And so a guinea pig rescue asked an AI company to help them name their guinea pig rescue guinea pigs. And so they used as a training set all of the previously adopted guinea pigs and then used AI to, um, to predict good names for that. There were clearly an acceptable list of names that this came up with. So you can choose um, Buzzberry or Princess Pow or the, the name that you want. But again, there were some misses. So, um, so you definitely have to make sure that you quality assure your AI as you're rolling it out because, again, I don't really think you need um, a guinea pig named me. Um, so to that end, I just want to thank um, my co-PI on the RPA project, which uh, um, Adam B. Anderson, Lawrence Court, and all of our global partners um, for that project, which is hopefully showing you at least some clinically relevant um, and ongoing research in the field. I'd like to thank the ACR, Dr. Bush, um, Dr. Laney, and, um, and Ms. Powell for, for inviting me um, and all of, their patients, all of our patients and their families. That's what I had prepared. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. Excellent. No, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Beal. Um, I didn't see what was so wrong with the uh, guinea pig being named Madly Mean. I thought that was uh, just a great addition to the original list. <laughs> but we really appreciate everything that you went over. We'll leave some of the questions for the end here. And we'll transition now right back to um, Dr. King. Okay. So um, I'm on my uh, phone Zoom now for the audio portion. Can you still see the screen? Yep, I can see and hear you well. Perfect, all right. So I think we had just left off. Um, we're um, uh, talking about AI for safety and workflow, AI to improve outcomes in AI and education and clinical research. 
Um, so for AI and safety and workflow, um, like uh, Dr. Beadle was alluding to, especially in head and neck cancer, you know, auto segmentation um, is a big uh, part of AI and radiation oncology. Um, uh, our, our institution, we're uh, actually doing a study comparing different auto segmentation algorithms and acceptability for clinicians and dosimetrists. Uh, this review article um, does an amazing job of going through the different epochs of auto segmentation um, from like old school intensity analysis and shape modeling all the way over to deep learning. And talks about the different metrics um, for auto segmentation. So I, I encourage people to look at this article. Um, and as Dr. Beetle, uh, we, we have a, an overlap in our uh, slide here. Um, the uh, 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 Alethia framework is a really um, interesting framework that's been adopted to oncology as well. And, and it's a great example of a, a industry uh, and uh, uh, oncologists, specifically uh, radiation oncologists, uh, Dr. Katz, um, in terms of uh, collaborating on creating uh, uh, good uses for AI. Um, and then our physicists are obviously very excited about uh, using AI for QA. And as you probably know, there's many different facets to QA from the, the machine to uh, individual plans. Um, uh, and, and again, for something uh, critical like you know, head and neck, IMRT, especially to uh, low, um, low and middle income countries, this could be very valuable. Um, and uh, Dr. Luke does a great job of uh, going over uh, the different types of QA and different methods being uh, used in this review article. Um, for uh, AI to improve outcomes, um, there's, I think um, we see a lot for AI to improve workflow and efficiency. For uh, AI to improve outcomes, um, we're still uh, getting there. Um, so uh, Dr. Appelt and colleagues um, review uh, 10 deep learning and 4 dbh based studies. Um, and uh, these uh, studies do a great job of integrating uh, different domain domains of, uh, of data. Um, and they draw a, a nice comparison to early NTCP modeling. Uh, you might remember, you know, before Quantech, um, so these were limited to small single institution cohorts, lack of external validation, inconsistent data reporting, and time to event not accounted for. So very similar uh, themes between NTCD modeling and uh, uh, AI uh, deep learning uh, methods. Um, another exciting area is uh, real world data. Um, uh, so so uh, Wang and colleagues uh, discuss uh, different uh, types of data sets. Um, <coughs> this is more of a UK centric, as you can see. Um, so uh, I refer readers to uh, this article in CA a Cancer Journal for Clinicians by Pepper Theodore, um, where they discuss uh, real world data sources. So um, this was a, a topic at the last Astro. Um, there's a huge opportunity in real world data. Uh, I think most of us don't even realize how much data there is, claims data, pharmacy data. Um, and um, it's uh, collected by different you know, uh, agencies, uh, private agencies, public agencies. Um, so I encourage uh, people to look, look at these articles. Dr. Dr. Kang. Yep. Can you? I'm, I'm sure, sure you're getting tired of your options. Would you manage to be able to switch to the presenter, presenter view? Oh, presenter. Uh, yeah. How do I? Like, by uh, switch. Over? Uh, actually, um, what I mean is uh, presentation view. If you're currently in presenter view, which is okay, it makes your slides a little yeah. bit smaller. Let me. Maybe I should stop sharing and then I'll reshare. Here we go. Is that better? That looks great, thank you. Thanks. Um, so uh, this article by Kim, Kim and colleagues um, is the first article that I've ever seen of its type, but it's a, a, like a, a narrative driven article about um, several uh, uh, clinical informaticists 
um, from different specialties and their journeys in clinical informatics um, from the different training levels from you know assistant professor to um, uh, associate chief medical information officer um, and some of their lessons are are very interesting I, I agree with all of them so you know, no experience however uh, is is uh, um, no experience however seemingly unrelated is a waste of time you should follow your interests even if atypical or they require additional training of course we're, we don't all have the luxury of that um, but it is okay to make mistakes if you can learn from them and that's i think a theme that you see in uh, in, in the tech industry in general um, finding mentors very important but it, um, sometimes you do have to look it, they're not you know they might not be in your department and yet you do have to look outside your institution perhaps or even in a different uh, field of study um, there is a lifelong learning component um, you know, uh, I'm, most of the listeners are probably not uh, like full-time computer scientists. So you, you have a, a different job as your quote unquote main job. And to keep up with the, uh, this material, you do have to you know embrace it and, and uh, really uh, take time to, to keep up. Um, that teamwork is a big component. Um, uh, I would you know leverage people around you, people have different strengths. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the active and pressing problems. Um, uh, Dr. Butel uh, discussed some of them already. So um, some of the uh, pressing ones are short-term mortality prediction. Uh, you're predicting um, emergency department admissions. These are some of the active problems that people in oncology are working on. And uh, this is kind of the framework when I think of uh, clinical AI. Um, when I think of you know what is a uh, what is something we can actually use in clinic? So we need an intersection of a good model, the, the right problem, and then educated users. So um, this was a, 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 a prospective trial out of Penn that uh, looked to validate a previously built uh, framework where they wanted to predict uh, patients as having a high or low risk of six month mortality. And their goal was to create a point of care tool to selectively screen for patients at a high risk of mortality or to uh, reassure uh, low risk patients. And um, there's a great value for this. You can create, it provides prognostic value to patients and oncologists. Um, uh, so their uh, variables, they, they had um, over 500 uh, structured data elements and um, they um, had trained their data, uh, which they published previously and they locked it um, and then they was run, um, run in the background of the Penn um, EHR for a period of uh, two months in 2019. Um, so uh, they uh, were able to collect a pretty big data set, 25,000 patients at 18 sites of practice. Um, and um, the results were uh, pretty good, uh, quite good in terms of stratifying low risk and high risk. So the low risk patients um, survive, uh, the vast majority survive uh, past 180 days at six month mark. And then the high risk patients, as you, as you can see here, um, by six months, about 50% um, were alive. Um, <clears throat> and they, they define high, high risk as uh, having a greater than 40% risk of a 180 day mortality um, in their prediction. So they were fairly, Fairly close, I'd say. I think um, um, confusion matrices are something that I think about a lot. Um, they, I, you know, uh, I think they're aptly named. They can be, it can be quite, quite confusing. Um, so when I, when I thought about this paper and kind of, you know, what it would be good for, um, one of the things you want to do is you want to look at the, the metrics. You know, there's different things you can use. Uh, they should. Uh, decision curve analysis is one of them, but um, by and large, you'll find that uh, most AI papers, will, they'll just report the basics. Uh, <coughs> uh, I won't go into the definitions um, for the sake of time, but um, there's sensitivity, specificity, positive, positive predictive value, uh, negative predictive value. So <coughs> for this paper, they, um, they, they did a really um, very 
uh, elegant uh, initial step, which was they surveyed oncologists. You know, how many, uh, what percentage of the patients that you see do you want to be actually flagged as being high risk? Um, as we know, alert fatigue is a big deal and uh, oncologists don't want like half their patients to be flagged as, uh, as high risk. <laughs> so, um, uh, the result was two and a half percent. So oncologists, they really just wanted to, to, to know the top two and a half percent of the high-risk patients. So um, when you fix this um, and you, you um, have the rest of the performance here, then uh, these are the metrics you get. So when you look at something that <clears throat> the sensitivity isn't great, but the specificity is really good, and the positive predictive value is, uh, is is pretty good, but but not, you know, not 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 amazing. But the MPV is really good. This to me is a less of, less of a screening tool, and more of a confirmatory tool, where you know if you actually think that they're low risk, um, um, they very much are are likely to be the case. But you know, if you think that they're high risk, you could be wrong half the time. Um, that said, you know, in this specific instance, um, if you actually use this as a screening tool, um, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to intervene for people to you know, see, uh, see palliative care earlier, basically. Um, um, it's, uh, it, the tool is actually uh, useful. So you might not get every single person, clearly you're not, but, but you are catching more than you would have caught presumably. And you're able to make a referral, <coughs> excuse me, referrals to palliative care earlier. So um, I think this type of interpretation, you know, this is where I think clinicians have a big role. Uh, you know, computer scientists, um, they don't have the domain expertise to kind of make these uh, nuanced interpretations of the data. But as a clinician, um, you know, we can we can think about these problems. I think and, and really help help our uh, colleagues. Who are doing some of the actual number crunch, you know, do you want to bump up the sensitivity at the cost of specificity, et cetera? Um, so I do encourage people when they're when they're when they're faced with a model to kind of really look at, think about kind of what they're ruling in, what they're ruling out, and whether that's a useful model or not. Um, another uh, a great uh, study and one of the few randomized trials we have in AI well, came from a, a Dr. Hong and colleagues. Um, called Shield, uh, Shield RT, where they um, did a randomized study of uh, early intervention um, during chemo radiation. The idea being that you you try you're trying to prevent uh, acute care visits by um, having phone calls and nurse visits, so to avoid uh, essentially ED visits and inpatient hospitalizations. Um, so they uh, created a model to stratify patients as either high risk or low risk. Um, and then they uh, they randomized patients to uh, either um, they randomized patients that are as high risk to either once a weekly clinical evaluation, which is your your standard OTD, uh, or mandatory twice a week uh, evaluation. And uh, the end, primary endpoint was the rate of acute care visits. <coughs> as you can see here, their results were quite good. We we're able to almost half the number of uh, acute care visits. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we, uh, we should com uh, commend Dr. Hong for uh, actually uh, proving his uh, work in a randomized trial. That's something that we definitely need more of in uh, uh, AI and oncology. Um, so uh, uh, this, earlier this week, there was a NCI workshop on uh, AI um, in, in just oncology in general. And um, one of the things they presented, which I thought was really great, was uh, the increase in the number of grant applications in the NCI. And um, there's a definite increase. So um, NCI actually, it is some curation to see um, some more data. And the, they uh, curated their grants down to 93 by excluding um, some of the, these criteria here. Um, one thing they excluded was uh, imaging only uh, machine learning. <clears throat> one interesting thing 
that came out was that uh, a, a ton of the focus was on hematologic uh, cancers, which I infer as being, as saying that uh, a lot of these are not radiation oncology uh, grants <coughs> and applications. So I think that's a kind of a wake up call for us. Um, and uh, these were uh, some of the, uh, the, um, the themes or the, kind of, uh, the types of studies that were being uh, uh, submitted for applications. So diagnosis projects, care quality metrics, symptom function adverse events. Um, you can see um, this is quite popular, uh, symptom function adverse events. Um, so um, I thought that was very interesting because it, it uh, coincides with one of my uh, interests, which is in um, looking at grant funding and finding research directions. So, you know, these are some of the themes that are for clinical AI models, and I, and I think about them in the context of clinical AI, but they can also be applied to non-clinical models. So um, this is uh, some work that I've um, done with, um, that's been led by two medical students, um, Peter Beadler, Mark, Mark Nguyen, as well as a couple of the residents here. Um, and our, our goal was to determine what ideas, topics, or themes are being funded by the NCI in departments of radiology or radiation oncology. Um, it is, that's unfortunately a single category. So we can't directly differentiate between radiology or radiation oncology in an easy way. Um, so kind of going backwards, I'm, I'm showing you some of the, uh, the actual results first. Um, what, what you can see here is uh, a distribution of the different grants. Um, and these are uh, funded grants. So each each dot is a <coughs> funded grant. There are about uh, 7,000 data points here. Um, they're ranked so that number zero is uh, the one that's increased in funding the most. And number uh, 59 is the, <coughs> the one uh, which uh, decreased funding the most. And that's, uh, I believe this is relative change. So what you can see here, um, and also they're, they're color coded. So red is uh, zero and then uh, like blue is 59. So the, the redder it is, the more it's increasing in funding. So a couple, <coughs> a couple of takeaways. Uh, therapeutics really, uh, really is increasing in funding. Um, I, th I think it's a split between biology and physics. Um, and then some of the top, top growing, uh, uh, sorry, give me one second, please. Um, um, the, um, one of the, some of the top themes that are growing are imaging biomarkers, AI decision support, imaging software, and radio pharmaceuticals. Um, so uh, this is some of the, uh, these are the methods that we use. So we, we converted grant abstracts to uh, BioWord VEC embeddings, which are word representations trained on biomedical and uh, clinical data. I believe uh, all of um, the MIMIC data set from uh, uh, Beth Israel, and as well as uh, all of PubMed, all the open access uh, papers. Uh, we clustered um, the document embeddings using a combined hierarchical k-means clustering. And we looked at um, two levels of granularity, uh, k equals 15 themes, and then a k equals 60, uh, which is more realistic, I think. And then we did manually validate about 10% of the grants over four raters at different training uh, levels with um, their concordance. <coughs> um, and this is uh, how we how we uh, code down our data set. Um, once we do this, then we can do things like plot uh, which areas in the country are uh, doing the most research in different uh, uh, um, You can see here the granularity of uh, 15, uh, 15 clusters as well as 60 clusters. <coughs> and, uh, um, we, uh, we did several rounds of uh, naming to kind of come, 
uh, come up with these names. It is, it is challenging. Um, the clusters, as you can see, they don't clearly separate. Um, um, and uh, the, they, they're assigned uh, one, to, one to one. So you can only assign to one cluster. So um, the, obviously if you're between kind of two centroids, you might just, uh, it has, it'll just go to the closest one. Um, but from this, you can see uh, overall general themes of uh, research funding, even if the cluster assignments are not 100% robust. Um, another area that we're, we want to apply natural language processing to is in clinical safety incident reports. So um, as, as, we, as, you, as you probably know, uh, there are national efforts such as Royals for this. Our institution, uh, we have our, our own uh, incident safety report reporting system. Um, and we've collected about 7,000 reports over the past uh, 10 years. And we make it pretty easy to put in reports. Um, and uh, we explored um, the themes, our safety and incident reports in, in, a, in a different way than the prior work, which used uh, word embeddings and pre-trained uh, pre word embeddings. For, so for this work, we, we use something called uh, uh, topic modeling, uh, specifically uh, correlated topic modeling, which is uh, similar to latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, so, Previously, it was uh, one one grant gets assigned to one topic. Uh, here, you can uh, topics are distributions of different uh, tokens, word tokens. So then, um, a report, a specific report, is also a distribution of di of different topics as well. So um, it allows um, um, a report to be, you know. Uh, a little bit about topic one, and then a little bit about topic two. Um, although the, the disadvantage of this is that it's not using pre-trained um, word embedding. So the words, uh, so all the training data comes from the actual reports themselves. Um, the idea is that we wanna be able to help triage some of these uh, safety reports. Um, and um, so you can see here, so these are some of the, the topics. And um, we try different approaches for, for naming them, including a top, a top token approach, as well as um, looking at um, reports that were greater than 95% about a, a topic. And um, sometimes we see a pretty good, um, uh, give me one second, sorry. Um, uh, you can see that uh, there is some uh, good overlap, and then sometimes, um, like uh, we don't have great great overlap between some of the topic types. Um, so hopefully that gives you a taste of uh, some of uh, um, the state of current AI and uh, some of the research applications. Um, I wanted to echo Dr. Decker in that currently we are um, a lot of it is better processes, but really we want better uh, better outcomes. And I think we're getting there. This is from 2018. So we want AI to disrupt things and, and make make uh, actually improve our outcomes for our patients, not just uh, workflow, uh, you know, automation, for example. Um, this, this, this was a perspective we wrote back in residency with Dr. Hong. I think it, they still uh, remains, remains correct. Uh, I like the, I like the, um, uh, I, the credit for the, the visualization goes to Astro. So um, just like Dr. Beadle was saying, ah, we're not replace humans, but I think we'll need to understand their strengths and limitations. There are, are, are a variety, <coughs> variety of domains where computational techniques may be relevant, but we do need to kind of be educated in these domains. I really wanna encourage uh, physicians as well as, as physicists as well to, to play a role in the development of AI tools. <coughs> and you know, AI, it's called, it has a word intelligence in it, but I think the word artificial is a big modifier. Um, a lot of AI currently is a really, really, really good pattern detection. And I think what we want is, um, we wanna understand those limits and then build upon them. So this is kind of my, my advice to people who are interested in this field. So I would say, don't do it for just AI's sake. Adapt your existing interests for uh, applications. 
um, join a research group or build up your own research group, and then really leverage your, your domain knowledge. Um, <coughs> um, it's hard to keep up to date with all the cutting edge stuff, but the domain knowledge that we have as clinicians um, is super viable and don't uh, discount that. Um, I think some of the, the work that I'm doing with the unsupervised, uh, with the word clustering, um, that really depended on domain knowledge to kind of interpret those clusters. It wouldn't have been possible if you didn't understand, you know, what a group of uh, grants meant, for example. So I um, just wanted to give acknowledgments for the folks in my um, uh, research lab. Uh, um, so uh, medical students, Peter Beeler, Mark Nguyen, uh, residents, August Anderson, Joseph Sai, and one of our uh, alums, Chen, Chen Zhang, who is uh, going to be joining Northwestern uh, Re uh, Radiation Ecology Re Residency uh, this upcoming year. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kang for pushing through both technical difficulties and I know you're getting over a cold there. And so I really appreciate you pushing through. Uh, that was very informative um, for me and I'm sure everyone else in attendance here. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Beadle for um, her excellent presentation to start off with as well. Um, we don't have too much time for um, questions here, but we did have one um, come up in the chat. So let me bring that up here. Um, so the question that they have, and, and either of you can, I can take a shot at this or both, um, was what do you feel like the biggest misconception of adopting AI-assisted contouring technology is? Um, and to expand on that, I had a uh, similar question as far as just, you know, resident education moving forward. I've had um, some attendees with concerns as far as, you know, as the auto contouring gets better and better, you know, what are we going to lose from resident education standpoint in drawing those contours? Or maybe it's not something we're losing at all and should move that to a different section of education. And so we'd be happy to hear your thoughts on that. I can start. Um, I think the biggest misconception is that you don't have to look at it. <laughs> you know, I think it's easy to click a button or um, let dose symmetry do it, but I think your normal structures are really pivotal in terms of what you're going to accept for your plan. Um, and so, um, again, as a head and neck radiation oncologist, I think we self select for um, kind of control freaks. Uh, so, and so I honestly do all of my normal myself. And if someone else or the resident or a, a program does that, I, I do go slice by slice and check them because. Weird things happen and everything's fine until the chiasm is in the lung um, or something like that. And especially for, you know, for the perfect patient that fits the perfect way that lines up well, that's one thing, but for that's not the world I live in. And so with post-surgical changes and weird anatomy and those kind of things, you know, I think those are the outliers that definitely we can have things that are not always perfect. So I think you just have to teach yourself to go through everything regardless of how it was birthed you know, but, um, by dissymmetry, by a resident, by yourself, or by a, by a machine algorithm. And to uh, Dr. Bush's point, I agree. I think that we still, there's definitely some learning process to having to do countless normal tissue contours and, and targets. And so we have to figure out if there is, again, um, easy ways to, to kind of replicate that in the system um, or, and to make certain that you know good when you see it and are able to do it on your own if you need to. So I think that's another thing that AI can help us with and that, um, that automation can help us with, but it's gonna be a pivot in terms of the teaching process. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, um, definitely with the uh, checking the contours, making sure that, um, um, that we are just blindly trusting the, the contours that the AI algorithm has given us. Um, we, uh, I, I did want to say, if, if anyone's interested and you're going to AAPM in July, um, our group is presenting results from our comparison of uh, Ray Station and MIM auto contouring tools. I think one of the a couple of takeaways: one, auto contouring is really uh, it seems like uh, their biggest struggle is at the boundaries. So at the uh, for the start of the esophagus and the end of the esophagus, for example. Um, check those. Um, and one thing that um, I think is, is very interesting is that um, I am, it, it's interesting that like, um, I think we expect the AI, AI uh, contouring algorithm to be like perfect, um, but you know, our, 
our dosimetrists make mistakes, you know, residents make mistakes, attendees make mistakes too. And I find that, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to be checking the long contour um, super carefully if a dosimetrist is contouring it. But if I'm, if the, AI, if, if the AI is contouring it, I'll be checking them to make sure the long contour is perfect. Um, uh, so um, it's some of the lessons that we're learning um, as we're going through like trialing auto segmentation. Yeah, I appreciate both your responses on that. It's something we've uh, definitely discussed at our clinic multiple times as far as, you know, potentially doing kind of like a bridge where um, you start just by contouring everything on your own, like without the auto contours at all, as far as like a new resident and then move up. Um, and it's interesting to see it develop um, just since I started because the, we, we use MIM and uh, auto contours that we had at the beginning of my residency uh, more were almost the opposite of helpful. Um, I just ended up having to delete them and redo it all myself. But now um, for many sites, um, Head Neck is certainly one of the most difficult ones, um, but for many other sites, I can I can essentially leave them alone with the exception of adding a few slices. So we're interested to see how that develops moving forward. Um, we had another question from um, Sung Jun Ma, uh, which is kind of an expansion on the education um, topic. And, and specifically is asking as AI gets more incorporated into our workflow, how can we as trainees incorporate AI into our residency program and training specifically? Um, yeah, I can. I guess I can uh, opine there. So, um, I, I think uh, I would. Um, is it Dr. Ma? Was it? Um, I recommend that um, the, the article by um, Ellen Kim and colleagues just to see the the potential ways to kind of get involved. Um, it it goes all the way from doing a clinical informatics fellowship, if you really want to be like a, a the, the chief medical informatics officer, for example, <clears throat> or a, a, a more, uh, maybe a, a less a time intensive way is to reach out to people doing research in your institution um, and get involved there. In terms of formal integration into, um, into the curriculum, um, there is an informatics component, um, at least the last that I remember it was getting revised when I was graduating. So I think it's been, it's in there now, but you know, it there beyond just mentioning it, it's not kind of fleshed out at all. Um, I, I think um, we're probably a ways into, you know, mandating AI be uh, used or be taught. Um, I think we can kind of look at radiology and maybe pathology and the medical physicists for inspiration. Um, since a lot, um, there, a lot of the, the groundwork is being laid by them and seeing how they integrate and then we can maybe see how we can want to do the same. We, I think the tough part is with residency, you're, you're doing so many different things. Um, it's, we have to be careful about just burning people with more things to learn. I think a great way to get involved is to be interested. I think a lot of the people who, you know, there's variations, but a lot of the um, more hardcore computer science um, people really want clinically relevant knowledge to test it, right? Like, so they don't, so if you can go and kick the tires and push the buttons and make it break, then they can fix it, right? So if you can say, this works really well for these patients, but not those patients, then they can work on those patients. And that's a vision that they don't get if they're not in clinic every day. So that kind of feedback and partnership, I think is really, really important. Um, and, you know, I met with our physics team and the grad students like multiple times a week, like this is a new um, algorithm, look at that. Well, that's useless, but, you know, to Dr. Bush's point, let's just delete that and start over because, but if you stay engaged with it, they can make it better. Um, and so I think that engagement is really important for both sides. And it, and if you just scrap it and don't give them that feedback, it's not going to get better. And I think most of the times it can. I appreciate it. Um, no, I think both um, very helpful as far as trying to get into our own dedicated um, research. But yeah, the question of incorporation into residency um, didactics just in general. Yeah, we definitely have um, some general informatics, but it's certainly not at the level of what you all are going through yet. Um, we do occasionally, uh, for any um, trainees on here, we incorporate some of our, our journal club articles specifically into AI. So I didn't know anything about, you know, fully versus semi-supervised machine learning. And so we did one of those and said something that you can at least do from program to program. 
Um, we are about out of time here. And so I'm gonna use one last question here that I see and then any additional questions, feel free to put in the chat box or Q&A. We'll get those answered offline. Um, but for both of you, um, what, what do you expect the future or hope for the future as far as artificial intelligence and radiation oncology to look like, you know, maybe 10 to 20 years from now? That's a tough question. Uh, um, hopefully we'll have much, uh, uh, we'll be closer to precision medicine. Um, you know, uh, I think health, uh, genomics will have advanced. Um, we'll have different doses. Like not everyone gets the same dose, basically. We'll have uh, uh, informed doses uh, based on people's risk benefit for side effects versus uh, local control. Um, We'll be able to prognosticate um, uh, better how patients will do. Um, we'll be able to do things like detect um, recurrence in our health systems, detect toxicity, um, basically capture, utilize all, all the data that we have better. Um, I, I find it very hard to predict, you know, 10 years in the future because things just move so quickly. Um, and definitely, I, I have no idea what's going to be like in 20 years. Um, I agree, with that. I agree with Dr. Kang. I think that we're going to have a lot more information about what's possible so that it's not going to be that my treatment and Dr. Amini's treatment is, are going to be as different as they might be just because a patient happened to see him or me. Um, and that, in fact, that we can have better efficiency. And there are some companies that are saying, hey, we can go to your center and we can look at all of your plans and we can train a system to make certain that we can recapitulate, give you the next plan that looks like all your plans. That doesn't tell you if all your plans are the best they could ever be. It, it leaves you where you are. And I think that we can have a lot more dose prediction on a lot more optimization. So hopefully our patients are going to get better care and more consistent care. I think um, it will definitely be crucial. And I think one of the biggest opportunities is to use it in clinical trials. Um, you know, fundamentally, if we look at clinical trials, deviations from clinical trial protocols are extremely impactful for overall survival and predict poor outcomes. Why do we tolerate that? You know, could we, could we quality assure local plans more quickly in order to tell them that they need to be fixed? Or could we just plan them centrally and ensure that everyone who is, who's supposed to get a certain treatment actually gets that treatment so we can test the question that's being asked and not whether people can follow directions. So my hope is that it's going to make care more consistent um, across the nation, across the world, allow patients to be treated more efficiently. And to Dr. Jacob's point in the chat, allow us to spend less time sitting in front of a screen and more time actually caring for our patients. Right. No, thank you so much. No, I know it's, I'm sure it's impossible, difficult to figure out what will be happening 10 to 20 years from now, but it sounds like the general synopsis from both of you that we're, we're all optimistic. I think that, you know, the partnership between creation college, and the artificial intelligence is going to be something that only continues to help the field and especially improving, you know, efficiency, workflow, those types of things now, and then hopefully outcomes um, long-term moving forward. So that's what I hope, you know, to see in, in 10, 20 years. Um, but at that, we are about out of time here. And so I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, special thanks, of course, to Dr. Yo and Dr. Kang um, for sharing all their expertise here. It's something that I think, you know, has become more and more intertwined with radiation oncology, but something a lot of us just don't have that much baseline education with. Um, so thank you again. And thanks to everyone in the audience for, for watching today. Please go ahead and fill out um, that um, post on our survey if you get a chance just to help us continue to keep you know, it is high quality and, and directly helpful um, to the field in general as well. And at that, again, thank you, everybody. And I hope you have a good night. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.